well. So what we're going to be looking at today is expanding on last week's lecture, because I'll probably be looking at the, the, the collateral effects of that. We were looking at the collateral effects of the collisions between planetesimals and the other solar system. Today what we'll be doing is expanding that and then following you through seeing how the, uh, those thermal effects and those collisions affected our understanding of the, the origin of, of um, the planetesimals and their thermal evolution at the time. So, so, so far we've, we've looked at how we built up around the sun this, this disk of uh, young uh, objects called planetesimals, we now know as the, the, the asteroids. Um, and these were rocky bodies around 10 to 100 kilometers in size orbiting our young sun. Um, so we'll be talking today more about how we get those things, how we keep those things up in the solar system. Um, and in the last two lectures we're going to be looking more closer to home, we'll be looking at the moon and then finally we'll look at um, impacts on the Earth. So today's lecture, first of all we'll look at evidence of why, why am I trying to explain how things got hot? Well we'll look at the evidence that shows that planet testing got hot in the early solar system. We'll look at the possible sources for that heat. Um, and then we'll look in, in some detail at, at um, modeling one particular parent body of, of um, meteorites and see if we can match those, um, those observations with our, our models. Many of the results I'll be showing you today are, are part of a um, collaborative effort between uh, myself and, and some other researchers, uh, my boss Fred Chester at the University of Chicago here, um, and some other um, people who collaborate with Gareth Collins from the Imperial College London and David O'Brien. Science Institute, and they've actually contributed a lot towards the results that I'll be showing you a bit later in the lecture, so I just wanted to acknowledge their work um, as well. So, to start with, let's look at heating in planetesimals. Well, we know very early in the lifetime of planetesimals got hot. How do we know that? Well, when we look at chondritic meteorites, remember these are the, the very unaltered meteorites that haven't really been heated too much in their, their lifetime. We do see evidence of metamorphism, so we see areas where it looks like they've been heated above their formation temperature. In some of the other meteorites, such as the iron meteorites and the achondrites, we see evidence that they've differentiated and melted. I'll come on um, in, in a bit more detail to, to talk about that in the next couple of slides. So first of all, metamorphism in chondrite um, meteorites. As I said, this shows that we have regions that got hotter than they were at that formation. One way to look at this is the relationship between chondrules, which are these circular grains within our um, meteorites, typically around half a centimetre to a centimetre in size. And you can see in this top left block here, we have what we call a, a type 3 meteorites. This has been re relatively unheated, if you like, since it formed. And you can see the boundaries between these chondrules and then the matrix material in between them fairly sharp. You can see them very distinct, the, the chondrules in here. To move to the top uh, right figure here, this is what we call a type 4. So this has been heated slightly more than our type 3. And you can see the boundaries between the chondrules are starting to break down. And more so in the type 5, you can see that the edges of these chondrules are a lot, a lot less distinct than they were in the, in the uh, meteorites with lower uh, heating. And then we get to this uh, meteorite in the bottom right, which is what we call the, the Type 6 meteorite. Um, and this has been very strongly heated. You can hardly even see where the tunnels were before the heating took place. And, and what we take this to mean is that as, as heat went through it, we crystallized those minerals and kind of blurred the boundaries between the different uh, grains. So this is evidence that we have that after the formation of these bodies, which formed with these nice pristine controls, after their formation, they would have gone through some sort of heating event, which has destroyed those boundaries. We also know that some meteorites, some, some asteroids, must have been heated a lot more, and must have got to the point that they melted. Um, the evidence we have for this is what we call differentiation. Now, in, in differentiation, um, what the, the model is that our, our asteroid formed from sticking together of dust and, and small particles into our, um, our, into our body. It got so hot that it melted, and we formed the core in the center. Now, once this material has melted, the heavier um, metal elements will sink to the center of the core because it's just now a liquid and things can flow through. So the heavier elements are going to sink to the core and will leave the lighter elements in a, a mantle and crust around the core. And what we can look at is the chemical signatures of this so that the, the silicon mantle around the metal core will be depleted in those metal elements. So some, uh, asteroid, some meteorites that we see are very metallic in, in, uh, in composition and we take those to be the core of one of these type of asteroids. And uh, some of the, the, by the meteorites we look at are what we call achondrites, and these have these kind of silica compositions from the outside of one of these melted and differentiated bodies. So that's just a couple of ways that we know that heating must have occurred in the early solar system. So something must have come along and heated these bodies after they formed. And what we'll do today is, is go through and look at what, what are the possible sources for that, what could have caused those uh, objects to be heated up to, to such high temperatures very early in their life. Now over the decades, many different sources of heat have been suggested because we just don't know exactly what it was. 
And so people have come up with different ways of making coal. Oh, well, this could be one possible method to, to heat up oil. Um, and I'll go through the next few slides just talking about some of the ones that have kind of stood the test of time and got to our um, got to, to, to today, while we still think that they could have formed the cause of some of the heating in these bodies. And the first of these is, is what we call electromagnetic induction. The theory here is that the sun, the young sun, is generating the magnetic. As the planetesimals move in their orbits around the sun, an electric current will be induced because of that magnetic field. An electric current will be induced within the planetesimals, and that electric current heats up the material um, as they keep on moving through. Um, however, if you remember back to one of the earlier lectures when we were talking about the disks forming around the young sun, if you remember this picture of um, this is of a, a, a disk forming around a young star that the Hubble Space Telescope uh, found. And you see this beam of, of energy coming out of the poles. And this is related to the magnetic, um, the solar wind, if you like, the, the magnetic um, field coming from the sun. And what it's thought is actually that most of the energy from this magnetic field, most of the energy is going to be coming uh, in the polar directions from the star. Well, most of our planetesimals are actually going to be in the plane orbiting around the equator. So actually, whilst this, this theory initially looked like it could be a very good for, uh, me mechanism to heat up planetesimals, it's unlikely to cause all that much heating, it can't cause all of the heating that we see um, in planetesimals. So that's, that's where we'll talk about um, the electromagnetic induction theory today. The next theory is, well, how did Earth get on? Can we apply that same mechanism to uh, planetesimals? Well, Earth's heat, a lot of it comes from, well, some of it came from impacts in the Earth's solar system, but a lot of it comes from um, the decay of radioactive materials. Um, that's what's led to us having a, a hot core in the centre of our planet and what keeps it hot and keeps the planet geologically active. In planet-sized objects such as the Earth, the surface area is small compared to the volume of material, which means that any heat that's caused in the centre of the body takes a long time to escape to space. It takes a long time to travel the distance out from the centre of the body out to the edges and then radiate out of space. And that means we can rely on what we call long-lived radionuclides to provide most of that heat. These are radionuclides with long half-lives that take you know, a long time to decay and therefore a long time to, to deposit their energy uh, into the planet. And you can see that uh, so uranium-238 has a half-life of about 4.5 million years. That's about the age of the solar system today. And we've got some others that are you know, on the order of billions of years, uh, uranium, thorium, and potassium, that can provide that heat. The problem we have with planetesimals is that their surface area to uh, volume ratio is much smaller. And what that means is any heat that's created in the body is quickly lost to space. It conducts to the edges of the the planetesimal, uh, and then just conduct out to the cold uh, disk that it's, that it's surrounding. But we know that these objects got hot within the first 10 million years or so, um, based on our radiometric dating of, of meteorites and, and the, the, some of the measurements we can make from meteorites. So this decay of long-lived radiant light wouldn't be strong enough to cause the heating signature that we see. But we can look to then some shorter-lived radioisotopes, such as aluminium-26 and iron-60, um, which have half-lives of around 1.7 million years, 2.6 million years. So they decay a lot quickly, and most of their energy will then be deposited in that first 5 or 10 million years um, after the formation of our planetesimal. That aluminium 26 decays um, to the decay product of magnesium 26 plus some heat. Um, and as you can see, what, what we look at here is then just an example. It's say we had a sample that was completely um, composed of aluminium 26. After one half-life, we have half aluminium 26 and half our material blue here would then be magnesium 26, and so on. And you can see after around 4 million years, 4 or 5 million years, we would have lost all of the aluminium 26 material, and we'd be left with just our magnesium. And therefore we can say then with some certainty that this heat source would be good for about 5 million years, 5 to 10 million years. And after that, we would then need to look for something else, if we see any heating after that. So what this means is that the formation time of the body dictates how hot it would become assuming that our heat comes from these short lived radio nuclides. And we can actually then look at some different objects. So we've got some uh, meteorites, we call the uh, acrobolkites, um, the ordinary chondrites, the carbonaceous chondrites. And you can see that based on the time we think they formed, um, you can see that their peak temperature in the center of the body uh, decays. So after around 4 million years, the peak temperature is much less than the peak temperature would be if it formed after around 1 million years. Um, you can see at this point, we get to the point where you can start melting. That's why we then have the ions formed in the first million years or so. How would this heat manifest in a, uh, a planetesimal? Well, what we have 
it would actually form what we call an onion filled structure. And in this structure, what we have is the hottest material uh, would be in the center. So this is this type 6 material that has uh, no kind of distinct boundaries between conjugal or matrix. That would be contained in the center. And then as you go move further and further to the outer edges of the body, we have what we call an onion shell structure. So we get cooler and cooler layers towards the outside of the body. And you can see why it's called an onion shell structure. If you just slice an onion in half, you can see the concentric rings, and that's where it gets its name. <coughs> And so, therefore, when we look at this, we would say, well, then our heterologic types, we can tell roughly where you expect them to come from in the, um, in our parent body. So the, the hardest material, what we call in our type 6 material, heterologic type 6, would come from the center, and the type 3 material, the coolest material, would come from the outer edges. And what you can actually predict from this model is that the material in the center of the body would actually cool the slowest, the material on the outer edges would cool quickly, um, because it's quickly losing all that methane uh, into space. And so therefore we would expect some sort of, sort of correlation between the cooling rate measurements um, we can take from, from meteorites. We can look at meteorites, um, some of the, the, um, the grains, we can compare them and see how quickly we think they cool through a particular temperature. And we should be able to compare that cooling rate measurement with the peak temperature measurement we've already made. And if, if this is the sole um, heating source, you would expect to see a nice trend between those two. We can model the onion shell structure using computer models and, and, uh, and try and come up with an idea of it. if you had a, um, a particular body of a size and you heated it with the amount of aluminium 26 we expect to be present in the early solar system, you can then come up with an idea of what kind of peak temperature you would get at different depths in the body. Um, so here's just an example of, a, um, of one of these models and on the, on the x-axis what we have here is time since the formation of the body. And on the y-axis, we have the, the peak temperature of that material is reached. And then each of these different lines just shows progressively deeper and deeper material uh, in, in the body. So this lowest line here is one kilometer of depth into the body, and you can see its peak temperature gets up to around 300 Kelvin. If you go to a five kilometer depth, you can see that actually we get much hotter material up to around 700 Kelvin, uh, and 10 kilometers of depth, we get up to you know, close to 1,000 Kelvin. And then as we get deeper and deeper into the body, we get up to around. This body in particular is size is quite to the point of get to around 1,200 Kelvin in the center of the body. So then we can, we can come up with these models, we can think of uh, a kind of general size of the body that we think would be in the, in the early solar system, and then try and model it and see if our models can match our observations from each of of different cooling rates and closure points. So as I said, we can measure the cooling rates um, by looking at, we, what we do is we look at the nickel concentration in metallic grains, um, and depending on the size of the nickel, nickel in the center of the grain, you can come up with an analytic um, way to say how quickly you think it cooled. Uh, we can look at the metamorphic grain, and that can give us an estimate of the, the peak temperature. And we can also look at the closure time. So we use radiometric ages to then um, tell us at what time a grain cooled through given temperature. And this has then been modeled extensively for the, for in particular, the age contract current body because we have a lot of data for that. So people are trying to come up with models that fit that data nicely. Uh, one particular uh, um, paper uh, modeling this is, is um, written by Dean Harrison and Robert Grimm in 2010. Um, and they, they took uh, basically a model similar to what I just showed you and then tried to optimize all the different uh, parameters, three parameters, so they didn't know the exact size of the body, exactly when it formed. And they took these three parameters, optimized them all to try and come up with the best fit they possibly could um, between their model of, of the onion shell structure and uh, measurements, all the measurements that they have for the age of Here's just an example of all the different points you can see here are the cooling rate measurements that they have for um, the age and This is then um, split into type 3 meteorites, type 4 and 5 if combined together, and type 6 meteorites. This is our ethnologic, our metamorphic type, if you like to say, increasing levels of uh, the peak temperature is at its highest on this end. This end. Um, and you can see then that they, their, their model is, is um, shown by this grey box, which tries to fit as many of these different points as you can. But you can see that all these measurements have very large error points. And they came up with a model that they thought was fairly good, and they showed that type 3 material cooled at around 0 to 50 Kelvin per million years. Uh, type 4 and 5 cooled at around 20 to 40 Kelvin per million years, and type 6 cooled at 3 to 20 Kelvin per million years. So you can see there's a general trend um, where the, the hotter material cooled slightly more slowly. Um, but they, could, they couldn't match all of the meteorites they measured. There was, uh, of the 71 that they actually looked at, they could match only 62 of them in this model. Um, actually, their, their tally of 71 meteorites that they looked at with data was a bit skewed because some of the meteorites they threw out for various reasons. So if you were to take the full data set, this probably would even be a worse match. 
out data. They then looked at the, uh, the closure time data. So this is uh, what we have here is seven different meter runs. We have plots of time on the x-axis and a temperature uh, at that time on the y-axis. So you can see then all these meter runs go through a, a temperature time bar where you can see um, at what time the meter run would be in the temperature. The, great, uh, the, the, the boxes on here are measurements we have from different meter runs. So this is for a given meter run, we have two or three measurements of closure times. So we know then the thermal path for that meter run had to go through. And they then took their model and found how many of these different paths they could fit um, material from their bodies could fit through um, uh, to, to show that their model would match the thermal evolution of our um, h thermal. And they actually had eight meteorites that they were trying to match, and they were able to match seven of them. So that's a fairly good fit, but didn't quite work out. Um, and they speculated that the anomalies between this and the, um, the, the reality, between their model and the reality, was probably due to an impact which came in and disturbed the onion shell. So something came in and punctured the onion shell and moved things around, and that would mean they were cool and slightly different rates. What we've been doing, um, the, the research I've been doing with the collaborators I showed you in the talk, is trying to determine what could impacts actually do. Could they cause this kind of an anomaly? Could they do more than that? Could they actually cause some kind of heating as well as just moving things around and changing them? So next I'll show you some work we've been doing quantifying the long time um, effects of, of uh, impacts. So this is building on our lecture from last week where we looked at all the collateral effects of a particular impact event. First of all, I'll we'll show you the seminal paper on this work was, was uh, published in 1997 by Fax Carlin and his colleagues from the University of Hawaii. And they took an approach, they used numerical modeling. This is one of their models, quite low resolution compared to the model we run today than it was 15 years ago. Um, they used some theoretical considerations and observations of craters on Earth to try and scale their results between Earth-sized craters and craters on asteroids. And they showed that one single impact event wouldn't really be able to raise the global temperature of an asteroid by more than a couple of degrees. And so they, they came to the conclusion, really, and this has been quoted since this um, paper came out, many people just come and say, well, impact can't do any heating. They can't raise the global temperature by more than one or two degrees. So it's not a, an effect we need to worry about, because we're looking at things that can heat by hundreds or thousands of but critically, their, their model didn't include, include any porosity in their uh, planetesimals. And as I keep talking about during the course of this lecture series, we expect our planetesimals to have grown with a high percentage of pore space in their, um, in their structure. Um, and as we looked at last week, the porosity can really affect heating during shock events, um, can really affect how hot something becomes when you shock it with a moon impact. Uh, this is just a, a recap of, of some of the key results from last week. You remember we talked about um, our, what we call our Hugonio and how we create more waste heat uh, in a porous material than a non-porous material, and this basically means that shock wave in the porous material will create more um, heating uh, in that through a given shock pressure. Um, and then we looked at some results of some simulations I've been running where we showed that the uh, porosity, if you increase the porosity, you drastically increase the amount of material that's heated to a given temperature. Now, could these results come in and change our conclusions about the role of impacts in the thermal evolution of plant testimonials? Could this show that Klaus Kyle's results are, um, are need updating to, to include the effects of porosity? Well, let's have a look at some of the, the models we've been running and see how you, how, how you think this affects our, our, our understanding. So here what we're looking at is two models. Um, we showed you these two models last week. On the left-hand side, we have a non-porous material being impacted at four kilometers a second, and on the right-hand side, we've included a 20% porosity uh, in that material. For each of the figures on the left-hand side, what you're looking at is the density, so you can see that the non-porous material is already more dense than the porous material, um, and it goes from red is very dense down to blue is low density. And on the right-hand side, we're looking at the temperature plot for each of these, so low, uh, blue is cold and, and red is hot. And as we run this through, you'll, you'll recognize these simulations from last week. Um, but you can see that after the impact, we actually have the, in the porous case, much more heating, much more burial of material, a higher retention of the heating material on the surface, um, and as a deeper burial of that material. Because of that burial, of, of, we're burying our heating material with some porosity, um, with some porous material. That actually leads to what we call thermal insulation. So any heat that's contained in that uh, region actually can't escape out to, to space as easily, and therefore will, will stay in the body for longer. We can then model what happened after the impact. What happened for the, you know, the time scales of that impact I showed you were probably minutes to maybe an hour or so in time. What happens 
if we look at over a million years or millions of years after the impact, how does that heat signature evolve through time? So what we'll do, we'll solve the heat equation. You don't need to worry about this. It's just showing that we, we have an equation, an analytical equation that can define how this heat evolves in time. And what we'll do, we'll run this through for 100 million years. And you can see, this, so this is just zoomed in on the region underneath the impact. This is the, the heated region that was the planet. So the impactor in red. Um, as we run this through, you can see how the heat evolves. You can see even after 10 million years, we have some material that's still up at around um, 1100 Kelvin in temperature. Around 50 million years, we still have some material that's 800 Kelvin. And 100 million years, the signature is still there. The material that was heated in our impact uh, is still hot underneath our impact. So, okay, we may not globally heat the body, but we have, we, we have added a very strong heat signature that is contained for many millions of years after the impact in this local region near the, near the impact, near the impact site. We can then look at, in this material that we know will stay hot for a long time, we can look at the cooling rate. We can see how quickly did this material cool over time, and then compare that to our measurements from meteorites. And so here what we have is the results of some of those models. This is our 20% velocity model in the center, on the top, what we're looking at is cooling rate on the, on the x-axis, and just the, the amount of mass that reached that cooling rate. And you can see then that the peak cooling rate, the, the, we have a histogram of all the different um, cooling rates throughout our back testing. You can see that the peak cooling rate is actually on the order of um, maybe uh, 20 to 50 uh, K per million years, which fits exactly with what the measurement we had from um, from the meteorites that we were trying to match, and from the onion shell model as well. And this changes slightly with porosity, the, the, the less porous the material, the quicker the cooling rate, um, but if we're still in the same kind of order of magnitude in a 50% porosity case, that would reduce down to around one Kelvin per million years. We can also look at the peak temperatures, and we see that we get a range of material all the way from type three, all the way up to type six material. So that would again fit nicely with our model of the h chondrite parent body, where we have some material that's um, in, in type three near the outer edges, and some material that's reached um, type 6. And finally, we can then compare the final measurement we have from these meteorites, the, um, the closure time data. So on the left here, we have that, uh, the, the fits from the onion shell model that I showed you earlier. On the right-hand side, we've taken our impact. We said, well, what happens if our impact happens at 5 million years after the formation of this body? We just picked the number out here. Yeah. And then we saw how many um, different cells within our, our body, our, our model, how many of these cells would fit these different closure, temp uh, closure time data that we had. And you can see in seven out of the eight meteorites that we looked at, the same, same eight meteorites that Harrison and Grimm looked at, we we're able to also fit seven out of the eight uh, meteorites with, with our data. And then we have to stress that this is just one impact event. We picked one impact size, one impact velocity, and one impact time after the formation. These are just numbers that we picked to be a typical impact, but they're by no means uh, the only impact that could occur. And just that one impact is able to fit all of these data. Um, quite nicely. So then the question becomes, well, is this a typical impact event? What other types of impacts would we expect? And certainly, um, you have to think, well, what would it, if we had a whole range of impacts on the body, how could that affect the, the thermal history of our parent body? So now what we'll do is we'll talk through a model I've, I've built over the last couple of years to try and explain what would happen on a parent body, the results of multiple impacts on its surface. What we'll need to first we'll find out is what kind of range of impact velocities and projectile sizes are likely to, to, um, to be required for, for our impact model, what kind of sizes do we need to study, um, and then we'll look at how, how important these effects are. If you remember back from a, a few lectures ago, when we were looking at terrestrial planet formation, you remember that we had these type of simulations where we were tracking um, the orbits of all these planetesimals and the terrestrial planets forming, and saw how these all evolved with time. Um, it's very easy to evolve the time and their collisional histories as well, we're looking at what bodies collide with what. And what we can take from these kind of simulations then, is we can come up with an idea of, well, when a collision occurs, we can come up with an idea of what kind of velocity that collision should occur with, and we can then see at a given point in time, what that average collision velocity would be, or what the, the distribution of velocity would be. And at the very early stage of the solar system, we actually have, here we have a probability distribution function, you can see that the average velocity is very low, less than one kilometer per second is our average, velo uh, average velocity. As we run this through time, you'll see that quickly after maybe a few million years, we come up to uh, velocities that are on the order of five to 10 kilometers per 
per second. If you remember the results we had from last week, at around 5 or 10 kilometers per second, porous materials can get very hot during these types of impacts. So after a few million years, we get to the point that our impacts become very important in their heating potential. We can also look at, from those models, we can get an idea of what the planetesimal population looked like in terms of the size of the planetesimal. Um, so here what we have is on the, um, on the x-axis, the radius of our impactors uh, ranging from uh, 100 meters on the far left up to 100 kilometers on the, on the right, or 1,000 kilometers even. Um, and you'll see as we run this through then that we can track what happens to our population of planetesimals as we go through time. What happens first of all is quickly the uh, population steepens at the lower end. This is where we create collisional fragments from lots of impacts to start with. And then as material starts to get lost, either accreted onto planets or lost into the sun or from the solar system, the, uh, the population decreases and falls back down. The dots on here, these represent the, the, the uh, asteroid belt today. You can see at the end of this model, uh, this was one of David O'Brien's models, you can see at the end of this model, we quite nicely match the distribution of the, of the asteroid belt. And he also produces a number that tells me what, the, what we call the intrinsic collision probability. So this is the probability at any point in time that two bodies will collide. Um, and you can use this to come up there and say, right, if we have a parent body and a population of impactors, at a given time, how likely is a collision to occur? So the model I've come up with then, we, we take a given parent body size, the target size. Uh, we advise, uh, advance our time counter through time, we select a random number, and using that random number and the intrinsic collision probability, we come up with whether or not a collision would have occurred. If no collision occurred, then we just advance the time counter and take the next time step and, and continue. If a collision did occur, then we, then we select two random numbers, we choose an impact of size and a velocity, um, and allow the impact to occur. We then calculate all the effects of that impact, what size of the freighter did we form, how much heating was done, and we disrupt the body. If we disrupted the body, um, if, we, like, if we didn't disrupt the body and our time hasn't reached 100 million years, that's as far as our model goes, then we go back to advance the time count again and look at what the effects of the next collision would be. And we keep on with this loop until either our, our collision is large enough to completely disrupt our body, if you remember our catastrophic disruption threshold from last week, we said if the, if the impact is um, energetic enough to leave the largest fragment being less than half the size of the uh, initial body that would count as disruption. At that point, we've stopped our model. Or if we get to 100 million years where we no longer know the velocity and, and uh, size frequency distribution so well, then we stop our model as well. And that gives us an idea. We can then look at the collision um, evolution in the first 100 million years and compare that then with the onion shell model where we think most of the heating from the onion shells in the first 10 million years. We can then compare these two um, mechanisms. And then after we've finished our, our body, we then go back and start again. We do this for hundreds of thousands of parent bodies and then come up with some statistics of how many impacts we think to happen, um, what types of impacts we expect to see on, on that body. And we call this model, it's called a Monte Carlo model based on the fact that we're picking random numbers and, and then seeing by chance whether an impact has occurred. Uh, and so it's named after Monte Carlo, the, the town in my code, uh, which is the scene of this. And this is the results for uh, one of our models. This is for a, a, a parent body that's about the size of what Harrison and Green predicted the h chondrite parent body to be. And we can see during its lifespan, if it survived 100 million years without being disrupted, you would expect to see around 13 or 1400 impacts on the surface of that parent body, of impacts as greater than 150 meters in size. If it was disrupted, there's a wide range of in, number of impacts you expect to occur because some things were disrupted very early and so they saw very few impacts, some things were disrupted later and they saw more impacts. We can then look in more detail at what size of impacts as we expect to occur. So we can say we, we would expect one or two impacts or something one twentieth of the size of the target body. We would expect one in four parent bodies to see an impact or at least one tenth of its size impacting it. Um, and we would expect to see uh, around 10 and 15 percent of parent bodies would see at least one impact that's one fifth of the size. And then using these results and looking at the number of impacts per million years, um, on this plot, what we have is time on the x axis and the number of impacts per million years on the y axis. And you can see the most impacts that occur in the first 10 or 20 million years. After that, we quickly lose. Um, our, this plot quickly drops off. We get many fewer impacts occurring later. So we can see then what this plot really shows is that the most important time for impacts to occur is during the first 10 or 20 million years, exactly the same time that the onion shell model, the decay of aluminium 26, exactly the same time that that was an important piece of us. So in summary, we showed that, uh, just to summarize these results, we've shown then that the um, impacts can cause significant heating 
Um, you can, which, and this thermal signature will stay around for millions of years, hundreds of million years. Um, and the thermal signatures are similar to what we see from meteorites. We can, um, we can compare our models with um, the onion shell model, and we come up with similar um, statistics of, of how well we can match um, those, those thermal signatures. And uh, one more thing to remember from this, impact heating is typically localized, ready to move decay is global. When you're looking at a meteorite in your hand, it's typically a, a round size of a, you know, a few centimeters, 10, 20 centimeters maybe, the bigger ones. So we're not looking at the global sample of this parent body, we're just looking at small samples. So you can't really say whether or not this one small sample is representative of the global, um, of the, the, the global uh, thermal evolution of that body. Many people have used the onion shell type models to try and predict what sizes they think the parent bodies would have been of different meteorite um, classes and what their thermal histories would have been, what the conditions in the early solar system would have been. And what we're saying from this work, is what we've been doing over the last year or two, what we're saying from this work is that those um, conditions that we think we knew of in the early solar system will probably need to be revised now that we can account for the thermal um, evolution from, from impacts. But there's still more to be done. You can see that we haven't quite completed the picture. We haven't looked at how impacts would uh, affect the thermal evolution if they occur at the same time, if we're running them at the same time as our um, onion shell uh, structure is going on at the same time. So this is just some results. See, these are unpublished results. We haven't got to the point that we've published these yet. But these are the, the initial results from our study trying to combine the two of these effects together. We want to know what happens if we have an impact at the same time that the um, radium nuclei decay is occurring. And so what we've done, we've taken eight different parent bodies, where we've taken the first one here is before any uh, decay of aluminum 26, so before any heat signature has been deposited by our radium nuclei decay. We then have an impact at five, uh, half a million years, one million years, two, five, 10, 20, 50 million years after it formed. And you can see how the onion shell would evolve, excuse me, how the onion shell would evolve through time. So you can see initially we get up to a point when we get very hot center. After around five million years, most of the parent body are other than the outer shell the reach high temperature, and then we start to cool off, and we have a slightly cooler, um, a, a wider cool shell on the outside when we get to around 50 million years, because the heat stopped, deposit, uh, the heat from aluminium decay stopped at around 5 or 10 million years, and that's why we then start to cool off. What I'm going to do now is run some simulations, uh, run these models through, and you'll see an impact in each of these at 4 kilometers a second, our impacts of one tenth of the radius, and you'll see how, depending on the initial temperature of the body, the, the, the impact um, event can go in a very different, uh, can cause very different effects. In the upper left here, this is the, the, the same kind of impact we've been looking at so far into the cold body. You can see we form this heat tincture that's then near, stored near the surface. If the body is slightly hotter, we get a similar kind of effect where we get this um, heated plug formed near the center of the crater. But if we get hotter still, I mean, at one million year, yeah, we still have this hot plug, but the, side, the shape of the crater is now very different. It opens a much wider crater because that material has less strength when it starts to heat up. Let's just run that again. You can see then as we get hotter and hotter, what happens here is we bring material right from the very deep regions of the body, come up into this very high central uplift, and then get deposited on the outer edges of the body. So in these kind of situations of five or 10 million years, you can see then the, the, what the impact is doing here is very different to what it was doing to re impact into a cold one. Here what we're looking at is if we take our, um, our cold body, the, the concentric rings here just show where the material started before the impact. So the, the lighter color shows it started from the very center, the darker color shows it came from the outside. On the left side here, we have the impact into our cold target. On the right here, we have the impact of 10 million years after formation. And you can see that in our cold target, most of the body is unaffected. We have this crater that forms on the surface, and a little bit of compression of these layers, but not much of the change. In the hot body, you can see the material has been brought up from depth up to the very, um, very near the surface and deposited around the surface. And what this means is that material is now going to have a very different thermal path to the material that was. Um, not moved around as much if it had been cold to start. We can look at how that affects the cooling rates in the material. We can say, given this is our, our impact of 10 million years again, we can then look at the cooling rates through time at 500 degrees C and say, well, how quickly did this material cool? And in this case, what we've done is colored any material that cooled more quickly than we would have expected beforehand. Um, 
we colored it in blue, and anything that cooled more, uh, more slowly, we colored it in red. And you can see then that around 13, 14% of mass has a cooling rate changed by a significant amount. So not only does the, the impact of cool heating, it can also actually disturb our, our cooling rate, which fits in again with the, the idea that we could um, disturb the onion shelf by impacts and, and would then lead to um, our need to reevaluate all those models of, of planetesimal formation in the Earth's solar system. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll come to the end, but I, I just want to mention one more thing, actually, about these models. Um, the, the Monte Carlo model I showed you, this was um, a simulation using, if you remember, the Nice model we looked at during the planet formation, where we just had our outer planets formed on their stable orbits and sat there for 800 million years before they moved their orbits back. That was the model we were using for these Monte Carlo models. If you remember, I showed you, there was, there was, we also have this other model called the Grand Tack Theory, where Jupiter comes right very close into the inner solar system. Well, what happens if we have to include that in our model? And that's another thing that we need to start including into our model as well. If that's becoming a more generally accepted model of outer planet um, evolution, we would need to account for that as well as our model. So there's still lots of things to be done before we can really come up with a clear picture of how impact and animal and decay really, um, really plays a role in the thermal evolution of these uh, planetesimals. But that's just the, the state that we're at today. That's kind of the, the latest state that anyone's got to in this research. And with that, I'll uh, stop and thank you and take any questions. <laughs>
there would have been small differences depending on the distance it formed from the sun. But on, on the kind of bulk scale, yeah, they'd be around the same. But it's just because they take so long to decay, and so they'll lose their heat so much more quickly in these small bodies, they just don't really have any kind of thermal effect on these bodies. Yes? The bottom right uh, image is similar to the upper left one. Why is that? <coughs> Well, if you think about it, one, if, if we were to take this to the next level, maybe 100 million years or 200 million years, this would actually cool right down to the point we'd actually be back to this point. So our, our material, um, i go right back to, go right back to the start. Back to this figure, you can see that if we take, if we look at the, the heat signature for all these different depths in the body, you can see after 100 million years, it still has some heat, but after maybe two or three, 400 million years, all the material goes right back down to zero. So once we get down to the point where everything is cold again, and then we put an impact, it's essentially the same as saying, well, what happens if we have an impact right at the start? So that's why um, later stage impacts and early stage impacts would probably do the similar things. What's interesting is what happens when an impact occurs when you still have the residual heat from the aluminum 26 in that body. Yes. For these simulations and the, the graphing over time, does it make a difference whether the impacts are relatively evenly spaced or whether they come in periods of clustering or greater intensity? Because these have been modeled on a single impact. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a level of complexity we haven't got to in our model yet. So what we can't do is take a parent body and model every single impact. We can't model 1,400 impacts on its surface. So all we can say is 1,400 impacts would have occurred. We'll assume that they occur on a fresh surface where an impact hasn't already occurred, and then add up all those effects. Um, if you take the, the more realistic view, some impacts are going to occur on top of impacts that have already occurred, on top of already compressed material, so that would change our results slightly. But actually, one result I didn't have time to show you here is that when you look at the amount of energy deposited from these impacts, the vast majority of it will actually come from a few large impacts rather than the many small impacts. It's a few, it's a couple of big ones, you know, the, the kind of size of the ones I can show you all slightly bigger. They're the ones that put all the energy, the majority of the energy into it and put all the most of the heat. So yes, while some impacts would occur on top of other impacts that may not have quite the same effects, I don't think on the grand scale it's going to make too much of a difference. And it's unlikely you'd have two very large impacts occur at the same position all the same time. Yes. Um. I, I'm a little bit confused as the condition of the plasmas throughout these impacts. How much of these, these are fairly large uh, components, how much of it remains liquid over a relatively long period of time? How much of it remains liquid? Well, actually, in these models, we're not getting to the point of melting. We're still beneath the melting temperature. So the material isn't liquid, if you like. It's still, okay, so, so it's a heat assume that all of these models assume a crystallinity from the standpoint of the rockets? For the onion shell models, yes. Until we get to the point that we start to melt material, then things change and things can flow like liquid. But at the point we're at here, we're assuming that it's, it's a, uh, a rock with strength in it, that it will stay where it is. When we put the impact through it, it will become, it will flow like a, like a fluid. It will flow um, whilst the shock wave is going through. And, and, but then quickly after that, as material stops flowing quite so quickly, it will then settle back and become solid quite quickly. So with the, the time scale is completely different. The time scale of the impact is about <coughs> minutes to hours. What I'm trying to get at is that the heat diffusion for a liquid is going to be significantly different. Yes. For that. For right. The, the, okay. So. The crystal material. Yeah. But, I mean, the impact. So the point that the, the impact will occur over minutes or hours, and that's the point that we look at. After that, well, probably less, probably minutes to for an astral. So we can assume crystalline. We can assume that it will quickly get to the point that everything then becomes solid again. If you get to the point of melting, then obviously that's when things are going to change slightly. But in general, we're not getting, or we're not getting much material to the point that it melts. Thank you very much. Yes? Is, it, <coughs> is the pressure from gravity a significant heating factor? Pressure from gravity is a significant heating factor, not in this size of body. I mean, we're doing in something the size of the Earth, but in this size, um, we've actually looked at this for a, um, a 250 kilometer radius parent body. The amount of the, the pressures in the center are going to be pretty low. They're not going to be strong enough to cause any heating. They're not really even going to be strong enough to cause any compaction of the material. Um, so I don't think we need to worry about gravity in, in this case. Um, 
uh, if we were to start looking at planet size things, then yes, we'll we start to continue to look at that in more detail. Okay, thank you very much.